Our next speaker, I'm really interested to hear about the STAR program. Uh, Dr. Uh, Whitney Entz is the Director of Clinical Services for the Service Training, Advocacy, and Research STAR Center for um, ASD and Neurodevelopmental Disorders at UCSF. Great. I was just happy to have Dr. Hendren keep talking through my time, and then I wouldn't have to go at all. So, unfortunately, I do have to present. <laughs> um, so I'm um, happy to follow Bob because what we're going to talk, what I'm here to talk about, is the new program at uh, the Department of Psychiatry, the Star Center, and a lot of what we do um, is sort of the level four, I guess, is what he was talking about. So I'll be focusing a little bit on our treatment services. Um, as well as the other aspects of our program. Okay, okay. I don't have any disclosures. Um, so the STAR program, it, uh, the four tenets are service delivery, our training, advocacy, and research. Um, and this is a new program in the Department of Psychiatry, and we really wanted to have a program that clearly integrated the clinical services alongside with the research services. And so um, all the families and patients that come into our center, we um, ask if they're interested in participating in some of our research projects and data collection as well. Um, as you can see, we are a happy bunch, a friendly, welcoming bunch, even on a cold, windy day. Um, over in Parnassus. Um, so our mission is to lead the way to better understand, treat, promote the well-being for people with autism spectrum disorder and other neurodevelopmental disorders. And um, I just want to spend a moment on the neurodevelopmental piece. So if we can uh, think back to what Dr. Leventhal showed that slide with all the other different types of disorders, we also want to see those individuals as well. We um, want to capture autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. We don't want to just be known for autism. Um, so in order to meet the mission that we have at STAR, we really um, are, we have committed ourselves to working and providing services to individuals across the lifespan. So we see individuals as young, um, recently seven months, um, and um, to 55 years of age has been our oldest patient so far. And so we don't want, um, there's many programs that are just focused on pediatrics, and we know that the needs of these individuals and families, they change and it's diverse as families um, and children and adults progress across um, the develop, their development and um, as they mature, there's just a lot of different needs. Um, we also want to be a clinical home. So what we found is that many of the families, it's getting very disparate. They have um, school programs, they have ABA services, they have their pediatrician, and there's no one person to really quarterback all of those different types of services. And so we try to be that home where they can come, consult with us, we can provide services, and we can also offer guidance and family support to navigate all the different needs that gets really complex and complicated. Um, and we also are interdisciplinary in our approach. Um, so one major difference um, with our program um, than the prior iteration of the Autism Center that was there before us is that we are really interdisciplinary and we work together across a multitude of disciplines. And so we've recruited people from psychology, um, behavior analysis, social work, speech pathology, we have psychiatrists, and then we also have our clinical and res um, research team. And so across our domains, we incorporate these different types of disciplines, not only in our research, um, but also in our clinical work. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit for the next um, few minutes on the different types of services that we provide. Um, in particular, one of the um, one of a very large aspect of what we do are provide comprehensive diagnostic assessments, and they're multi-day assessments um, for our families, and they start and end with meeting with our social worker. So we really want, um, so our social worker is the first point of contact for our families and then also our last point in, for contact. So, because um, we know that the assessment is really just the first step in the journey for the family coming to see us. It, it's more that a lot has to happen after the assessment is done. It's not the, the end. So that we provide feedback. Um, and when I was listening to Dr. Leventhal, I was really reflecting on 
how he was saying how you look at the symptoms and what you need to assess and address. And all of those components have been clearly incorporated into our assessment process through our psychology visits and um, when necessary, we, we add speech consultation um, feet and also behavioral assessment in the diagnostic assessment. And we also have our psychiatry appointment in order to really complete that medical exam and all of our psychiatrists are focused and um, for working with individuals on the spectrum. Um, and these are the, um, the main domains that we uh, assess and look at and we really want to individualize our assessment process um, based on the needs of the individual. And what we hope to look at are different, the different levels of cognitive abilities, adaptive living skills, social communication, and social emotional development. And our goal with the assessment process is to help develop a comprehensive treatment plan. So telling the family what they need to get, how they can address the specific needs of their own child or adult. Um, we really want it to be individualized and be a plan to help them move forward. So just in terms of what we've seen so far in our center, we've had a range um, of individuals that we've seen. Um, as I mentioned before, the youngest that we've seen so far for a consultation um, has been seven months, but for assessment, it's been about 14 months, and we've seen individuals um, up until about 55 years of age, and we have a few um, more adult, older adults on our, on our waiting list right now. Um, we've also seen a range um, of individuals with autism. This is just the, primar the final primary diagnosis, and this also um, incorporates some families who had already had a previous diagnosis of autism, and they were coming in just for a prior, for just a reevaluation. Um, so we expect this number to fluctuate and change um, over time. And this doesn't um, take into account the individuals that may have comorbid diagnoses that Dr. Leventhal was also indicating. So individuals who may have autism, but also anxiety or depression or autism and intellectual disabilities. So um, this is just capturing the final diagnosis. Um, we are committed to serving our families within the San Francisco County and also the Northern California, um, the counties. And so about 86% of who we've, of who we have seen has come from that um, demographic. But we've also um, been a, a place for an assessment for individuals um, internationally. So we've had families come from China and Turkey and also um, out of state. So we've had families as far as New Jersey and North Carolina coming to get intensive treatment and or assessment with us. Um, so in terms of the treatment services, so the level four that Dr. Hendren was talking about, we are really working um, to all of the services really we think about how can we reduce the challenging behavior or the rigidity um, of the with or disruptive behavior or aggressive behavior. Um, we also um, focus on building social communication and play skills um, in in some of our little kids that come in. We uh, target inter, uh, increasing peer interactions across the lifespan and improving adaptive skills. Um, I just want to spend a moment on the adaptive skills. This is something that we. Um, clearly focus and target on quite a bit in our assessment reports and also our treatment planning. There's been some really nice longitudinal research um, come out from University of North Carolina from Dr. Klinger showing how important it is to work on adaptive skills and how much um, that helps with long-term outcomes. And so we talk about um, working on little adaptive skills, chores um, when someone's younger to being able to pay for services on pay for food or do laundry or cook for themselves as they get older. Those are the skills that sometimes I found some programs have often let out, um, left out and they focus more on social and play skills, but the ap adaptive skills really leads to really um, high um, long-term outcomes. And so that's something we talk about a lot. Um, and then we also, our treatment services focus on uh, emotional and attentional concerns as well. So, um, as I said, we're interdisciplinary. So all of our services are offered um, in different formats with different um, service providers, and some of them overlap um, more so than others across different time points. So we have psychological services, behavioral services, speech, and uh, medication management. 
And across our treatment services, the big overarching process throughout all of them is focused on evidence-based interventions. And then within that, we really focus on the child and the family first. And as I said in the beginning, we know that it's it's not just our child or the family in isolation. There are different rings of providers and different people in their life that is impacting their ability to function in the world or the skills that they're learning. And so we want to help coordinate those different types of services as well. And so we really focus on working with the family, engaging in parent training, and also consulting and talking with other providers um, ABA providers, school services, um, the place of work that the individual may be at. So um, the way we provide the services and is a different way, different modality. We have some individual services. We have a huge arm of family support. So for families who just have had a recent diagnosis or there's, they are struggling to figure out the different types of connections that they can make or service systems, how to navigate that, we have our social worker leading the way with our family support services. We provide consultation. And a big, a big component of our service delivery model is parent training. And so we focus on working with the parents in order to teach them how to implement the skills. And this goes way back to the early studies of um, Ivar Lovas at UCLA who found if you just work in the clinic and don't train the parents, the, the skills that the children learn will decrease over time. And so we know that we have to work with the training, with training the parents or any caregiver or any other individual in that child's life or adult's life to really produce meaningful and long-term outcomes. And so that is a big area of focus of ours. And we also want to try to serve a wide number of individuals and families. And so we've also offered a number of different group services. Um, our services uh, focus on a wide uh, range of different types of treatment models. Um, our behavioral and speech services really take into account um, the naturalistic behavioral Naturalistic developmental behavioral intervention is a new term that's used for more naturalistic type of um, applied behavior analysis programs. Um, so two that we use um, prominently in our clinic are pivotal response treatment or training, PRT, and uh, also early, the Early Start Denver model that Dr. Hendren was uh, speaking to about with uh, Sally Rogers. Um, we also, across our behavioral programs, use positive behavior support and a component of optimistic parenting. Uh, we incorporate, when needed, structured teaching or visual supports from TEACH um, and behavioral activation and for um, our individuals with other comorbid conditions, anxiety, depression, we uh, provide cognitive behavioral therapy on an individual basis. And we're also offering a social skills group, the peers model um, developed by Liz Logginson at UCLA. Um, so this is one of our, uh, this is what we've conceptualized as our together series. And it, you, there's, it's not that you go in order, you can enter in at any time point. Um, for this together series. The first, um, the first program is our first steps, first steps together. So this is a group that we offer to pa parents who have a recent diagnosis um, in their child. Right now we have it focused on children um, two to six, but we're hoping to expand it because we know um, that's not the only time um, parents uh, receive a diagnosis of autism. But we, uh, the focus of the group is really to um, increase the knowledge of the parents in terms of autism services and how to navigate the, the supports, the community supports that are out there. Um, two groups um, that we have based on the principles of pivotal response treatment, um, we have motivate to communicate together and then motivational early learning together. And these are parent groups. There are about um, 13 sessions in total with uh, nine groups of, and then each family gets four individual sessions. And we in include a didactic portion of pivotal response treatment with video clips of parents implementing PRT. And then the subsequent weeks, families are sent home. They have um, homework, essentially, to practice with their kid the skills every day, and they have to videotape themselves. And what they do the following week, I guess it's not videotaping anymore, it's digital recording. Um, 
it's back in the, my graduate school days, but um, when we had the tapes and the, but everybody's recording on their iPhone now, but they, uh, we asked them to bring back their video recordings and we uh, provide video feedback based on the implementation of the skill. Um, so that's one component for them to get direct um, feedback on the positive um, and constructive parts that they can um, do better next time. Um, and we really find that the parents are feeling more empowered um, by uh, engaging in the group and learning the skills and feeling like they, they can produce change in their children. The first group is really focused on first words. Um, and the first group was based on the research that was done at Stanford um, by Dr. jung who was a colleague of ours um, in Santa Barbara. And what we have done is expand that group into our motivational early learning. So we know that the first words isn't the first step, but we want to teach social initiations. We want to teach engagement. We want to teach play. We want to teach emotional regulation. And so the second group builds upon the first group. Um, and the third group in our um, Together series is really focused on challenging behavior. Um, and so again, it's a similar format. This one has, it's, it's a bit longer. It's half individual and half group sessions. So parents are learning how to conduct their own um, kind of ABC or behavior analysis, understanding the function or reason why um, their children are engaging in challenging behavior from rigidity to um, just not liking um, when something changes or just getting really frustrated and hitting. So there's a wide range of different types of behaviors that are focused on in this group. Um, for our social skill groups, um, we try to serve the gamut um, of of age range. So we have a preschool program for children four to six years old, um, and then we, ha we go all the way to young adults from 18 to 35 years old, and we just started our young adult group last night, and it was quite a joy to see them all come and get really excited about participating um, and learning new skills. Um, for all of these groups, it's the social group where the child or adult is um, participating in the group, but also, again, that parent component where the parent or caregiver is in a group at the same time, just working uh, and learning about the skills and then helping support those skills throughout um, the, six, the 14 to 16 week group. So it's a bit different than some of the other social skill groups in the community. Our program, um, we're trying to meet the needs of the community and so we also know that the transition age, um, more so than just social skills, but other needs. So how do you uh, get a job? How do you transition from high school to college? What are the legal needs, conservatorship? Um, we've, we are, um, because to meet that meet need, we're um, offering a transitioning together group. This group also has the, the teen or young adult and the parent group component. And um, we also um, found that we were seeing a number of school-aged children, um, about 8 to 12 years old, and there was no um, service. The families were asking for a social group, and so we are meeting the need and providing that group for them right now. Um, this is just a progression of the different types of service, of the specific group services that we um, have offered since the beginning. And so you can see the, the rollout from July of 2015 to where we are now and how they kind of keep stacking up and we continue to want to grow and meet the needs of our, of our families. So the T in STAR stands for training, um, and this is a really big component of our mission. Um, we offer interdisciplinary training for psychiatry residents and fellows, so they rotate through our assessment clinic. They also participate in our groups. Um, we are working to incorporate psychology interns and fellows. Um, we've had neurology residents rotate through our clinic on multiple days to get exposed to autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders and pediatric residents and students. Um, and we're hoping in the future to have practicum students from other different programs as well. Um, we are lucky enough to have um, some of our faculty um, with very advanced training in autism assessment. And because of that, we are able to offer the ADOS. So that's the big, that's the tool, one of the, goal, one of the tools that we use for autism. Um, and as Dr. Leventhal said, you don't just use the ADOS, you use it in conjunction with everything else and clinical experience. But this is one of the tools that is used. And so we offer training um, 
in the ADOS, and we also uh, provide training in the ADIR which is the autism diagnostic interview. So that's the parent interview to gather um, symptoms of early development and current levels. And in the future, we want to provide um, training in pivotal response treatment. Um, this is just to show um, that what training we have done since we've been open. We have trained about 200 and people, 202 people um, in, the, in the ADOS, and you can see we've had Research, researchers trained, we've had a number of school psychologists come in, clinical psychologists, medical doctors, speech pathologists, and social workers come to our trainings. And um, we plan to increase, um, we're having an ADIR training in the next few months. Um, the A stands for advocacy, and this is the part of our program that we are continually developing, and how uh, it's conceptualized right now is we are providing support for our families um, and advocating for our families within school IEPs and coaching families how to read the IEPs and to gather more understanding um, within that domain and also how to advocate for health insurance. Um, the mandates are confusing for families. Some people have self-funded plans and they're not able to access the services um, that other, other families are able to. So we try to um, support our families in that domain. Um. And um, this is our, the research, so the R part of our program. So this also conceptualizes everything that we work intervention-wise um, with the research arm. And so there's different types of research. You got to hear a little bit about Dr. Hendren's research. Um, so he's part of our group as well. So we have biological genetic research. We look at symptom profiles. Um, there's epidemiological research. Um, we have lifespan outcomes and also intervention. And so many of the programs that we're offering right now, we are researching and looking at the social validity, seeing how um, meaningful the families find it, how useful they find it as well. And so um, we want to continue to um, look into our program, see what's effective and how we can move forward and change. So this is just an illustration of um, the different types of labs that we have. Um, and everyone is doing, um, there's lots of different projects and on our website too, you can get directly in contact with the individuals. Um, and this is just, um, Dr. Ball will be presenting, but I wanted to, she won't put it up there, so I figured I would. Um, she's uh, looking at exploring the strengths and challenges for adults with limited spoken language. So there were flyers up on the second floor, I believe, or first floor, however the building is done. But um, so if you know of anyone who may fit the, this profile, we are happy um, to accept them into the research program. Okay. I saved time. 